Dr. Uh, Bush is okay. going to give us an update on the uh, clinical and epidemiologic aspects. After that, we have a very interesting presentation by the team from One Blood on uh, plasma therapy from uh, convalescent patients. We've heard a lot about that on and off, but it's just about here and real. And these are the folks that are going to be involved in collection, processing, and uh, distributing the specimens. So that that is brand new news we're going to be getting from the One Blood team. And then Jeff is going to give us an update on any of the regulatory issues. And uh, Jared Fowler is going to give us an update on the uh, regulatory news and financial news, particularly regarding the uh, um, CARE Act and, and how we can go about accessing the various uh, federal programs. Uh, so with that in mind, if uh, Mr. Santorio is not yet uh, live on, on the microphone, why don't we have Dr. Bush give us his update? Thank you, Dr. Giffler, and thank everybody for attending and uh, listening to this. I'm going to give a brief 10-minute slide presentation on uh, some information since our last virtual meeting last week. So this is, in essence, first I'm going to start with statistics. So this is as of 8 o'clock this morning. In the whole country, 311,533 cases, 8454 deaths, which is a mortality rate of 2.7%. And remember, that's a mortality in people who've been diagnosed. Obviously, there are many people who are not diagnosed. Therefore, the total mortality rate for COVID-19 in this country is unknown. But even as Anthony Fauci says in his New England Journal of Medical uh, Medicine editorial this past week, but doesn't say it in public, is he believes in the end, if you tested everybody in the country, the mortality rate will be somewhere between 1% and 0.1%. He says closer to 0.1%. If you look at just at Florida, 11,544 cases as of uh, 8 o'clock this morning, 195 deaths that we know of, 1.6% mor uh, mortality. Again, that's of people who've been tested and diagnosed. How about those who are ill, not tested, or those who are asymptomatic and infected, not tested? If you go back to the U.S. numbers, you can see that 80% of all cases in the U.S. come from basically 10 or 11 states, New York, New Jersey. Michigan, California, Louisiana, Massachusetts, Florida is there in the middle. You can also see that Washington's moving down the list because what they've done seems to be effective as far as social distancing and other things like that. When you get to Florida, about 73% of cases come from a handful of counties, Miami-Dade, Broward, Palm Beach, Orange, Hillsbury, Duval, and Lee, places where you would almost expect because this was an imported disease and therefore local transmission can't occur in parts of the country or states or counties where it wasn't initially imported into. So it's obvious why those areas have the most cases and should get the most attention. Let's just look at the trending case numbers. So this is off the CDC World Health Organization USA data. We're starting on March 27th, going down to yesterday's data, ending on uh, last evening at midnight. If you look at it, you can see the total number of cases that are increasing, obviously, and it's obviously tripled since March 27th till April 4th, at the end of April 4th. Well, for obvious reasons, either there's a lot more transmission or we're testing a lot more folks. I think it's the latter, because if you look at the right-hand column, number of new cases, you can see that the number of new cases every day obviously is increasing. Over the past three days or four days, statistically, that's probably within the realm of the same. And that's in the face of testing many, many more people. Uh, because as you know, some places have rapid tests, others are still using slower tests. So having said that, if you look at the so-called exponential growth, that's not an exponential number that's occurring on those numbers. That's a sequence of local transmission and more testing, but it's not exponentially rising. I look at that as a glass half full as opposed to half empty. I don't see the exponential. But having said that, you can see how many critical care beds are there per capita for selected countries. And although the USA takes a lot of hit for not being prepared, you can see per capita, there's more critical care beds in this country than anywhere else. And if you look at the other countries with less mortality, such as Germany, they also have the increased amount of critical care beds compared to Spain, who has at least one third or less than we do. 
and they're testing mostly people who are very sick. I know that for a fact, then as opposed to people who are coming in and going home from ERs or walk-in clinics. So they're not doing that in Spain. You can't walk into an ER and say, I want to be tested because I have an upper respiratory tract infection. And then if you look at China, where this started, and India, a lot less critical care beds. But having said that, you know, the, the negative predicted predictions are severe hypoxic respiratory failure in an ICU that are predicted for this country are numbers such as that. Whether we'll get there or not, that's the American Hospital Association. I, I personally don't think so, but obviously time is going to tell. And if that's true, then how do we really know how this is transmitted? Well, this is a respiratory transmitted disease. And of course, droplets, either droplet or airborne, can get on fomites or surfaces or clothing. As far as stool and perinatal transmission, yes, it's possible, but it's not something I think we really need to take into consideration. Which brings us to how quickly and when do people shed viruses? Well, viral shedding is greatest at the time of symptom offset. This comes from the New England Journal of Medicine, very recently published. They look at the viral loads in 17 symptomatic patients. They looked at both throat swabs, which are the darker ones, and nasal swabs. It shows you, obviously, nasal swabs are more accurate. There's no data regarding the duration of replication-competent virus shedding. In other words, just because you can test positive for PCR, is the virus really growing by culture? And that's an unknown. So many of the things we're doing here are unknown, but you can see that the days since onset of symptoms drastically the shedding drops by PCR isolation as you move along. And also, remember, we're doing real-time qualitative PCR, not quantitative. When we talk about measuring a viral load with hepatitis C or hepatitis B or HIV, we're actually measuring copies. If you just want to know if somebody's infected with hepatitis B, you can just do a qualitative or a, let's say, an example, HIV is a better example, a qualitative RNA test. It doesn't tell you how many copies. And right now, our detection of copies is 20. So if you're less than 20 copies RNA, HIV, you're considered undetectable. And the government says you're untransmissible. Well, that would mean that if you're 19, you're not transmissible. And if you're 21, you're potentially transmissible. Same thing goes for here. How many copies of PCR are really being detected far out on that curve? That's another unknown. Which brings us to the many unclear unknown facts about transmission, and I listed them. Does exposure to the virus lead to active infection to everybody? It used to be said that rabies is 100% fatal, but you can find a host of people with antibody to rabies who have never had clinical disease. It was also said that 70% or 50% of people who contracted Ebola died. In a Lancet article after the outbreak in Liberia, they showed that a large portion of the population had IgG antibodies were never sick. So maybe that's not true. How many acquire infection remain asymptomatic? Well, we'll know that later on by convalescent serologic testing. When after acquisition does one become symptomatic? How would you know if they don't become symptomatic and if we're not testing asymptomatics? When after acquisition does the PCR test become detectable? Same dilemma. Does any PCR test mean you're contagious? Well, I just gave you the example for HIV. Are symptomatic infected persons more contagious? Well, obviously they are, but when do they become less contagious? When does a symptomatic or a recovered person stop shedding? Well, that's the recommendation of three days, no fever, seven days from symptomatology onset. Theoretically, you can go out into the world. Whether that's true or not, we're gonna find out. And there's recommendation from the country and from the state. When does an asymptomatic person stop shedding virus? Again, a test we're not gonna know. So how can we place so much blame on the understandable delay in testing availability? How can you test for something you didn't have a test for? Which makes a lot of sense to me, and I don't think we should lay blame on the fact that we haven't tested, because the truth is we're testing more people in this country than any other country in the world. So let's look at this example. This was in the MMWR, which is a publication of the CDC recently, and this looked at the Diamond Princess uh, uh, ship. And what they found was out of 3,711 passengers and a crew, 19.2% or 712 tested positive for having shown that they were exposed to this virus, whether they were symptomatic or asymptomatic. But you can see on the top left, almost half of them, 331 of the 712 of those two tested positive 
were asymptomatic when they were tested, meaning, yes, asymptomatic people can have positive PCR. If they're shedding it and contaging people, that's an unknown. Statistical modeling, however, suggests that almost 20% of infected in this study, 17.9, never develop symptoms. Well, these are things that we have to factor into when we're talking about closing down things, social distancing, when can people go back to work, what's essential and what's not. Well, other than PCR testing, what do we have? Well, you may not know this and possibly, or hopefully you do, is that just this week, a day or so ago, the FDA approved under an EUA, that's an expedited or expanded uh, utilization access. A company called Celex has a serologic test and it goes like this. It's a five minute to 10 minute, or excuse me, 15 minute rapid test using a drop of blood or serum. So you could use it from their finger, you can use it from blood that you already have in the lab. What's the data provided that allowed the FDA to approve this test? Well, they looked at 128 individuals who tested positive by PCR. And out of those, 120 or 94% either had IgM, IgG, or both by this simple test. What does that mean? That means it's a very sensitive test there aren't very many false negatives. In this sense, there were 6% false negatives. Eight people who had it failed to have a positive serologic test. And that could be for a reason of when do they turn positive? When did you collect their PCR? Secondly, out of the 250 individuals who had a negative PCR test, 239 by the serologic test were also negative. That's a 96% specificity. In other words, how specific is this test for this disease? Very specific. But the questions that go unanswered, when do you become positive serologically after infection? Well, you wouldn't know that because we don't know exactly when your PCR becomes positive. Number two, what degree of protection do you really have from these antibodies and for how long? Well, we know the reason we have a high dose flu vaccine is because elderly people getting the routine flu vaccine, although they produce IgG antibodies, they're not as protective in the 75 year old as they are in the 45 year old. Therefore, we give them a higher dose vaccine to boost their IgG titer. So we don't know what titer here is going to be protective in the short term and long term. And then finally, how long do these antibodies remain positive in you? And does that mean you've cleared the virus? But going forward, does that mean you can't be reinfected with this virus? Well, we all know there's certain diseases that we have IgG antibodies to, Lyme disease example, where you can become reinfected. The bottom line is, yes, this is very helpful, but the future of where these are going to be used is still not known. And as of today, a patient who tests positive or negative for this still has to have a PCR test. And if you're going to use this serologic test, the government requires that you still report your positives by this serologic test. This is what it looks like. Look at the test at the right. You put the drop of blood in that little red dot where it says sample. You have the C means the control is positive. The blood moves up there like a litmus paper. The serologic test is impregnated into that litmus paper. And you can see on the left hand, this was done at, at a hospital where I work. We did this yesterday. We took a positive patient down there called BJ, who's on a ventilator. She's been positive in the hospital for about 10 days. I don't know when she became symptomatic at home, but you can see her IgM and IgD tests are both positive. The fact that the IgM bar is a lighter color than the IgG, that's just the way the color coding is here. If you look at RC, who is a patient admitted to rule out COVID, his uh, PCR test was negative and you can see his serologic test was positive. This is very encouraging, and it's very rapid, and it's very cheap. This company who provided this one, selling these for $8 a piece, and if you buy bulk, they're cheaper. How about protective co covering? Well, that, that's a big, you know, what's going on with this? What are the controversies and conflicts about masks, and what are the recommendations? Well, when you're talking about masks, you're really talking about Hello? something that covers your face and your nose. Yeah. We're talking about surgical masks, N95 masks, and any cloth that covers your face. Surgical masks basically mm -hmm. keep you both from spreading organisms or secretions, and that's N95 exactly. means that anything that's floating in the air that's less than 5% uh, microns, it filters out 95% of them. A cloth mask isn't necessarily going to do that, but the main thing here is are you talking about spread or acquisition? Are you talking about droplet isolation or airborne? 
We know that things like are airborne, a varicella zoster, measles, German measles, tuberculosis, you need a negative pressure wound because a small drop of the particles float in the air for a long time, and therefore they can be inhaled when you're not in the droplet zone, which is described as six feet. When you're talking about spread, why should anybody wear a mask outside? It's because if they're asymptomatically infected and therefore they're able to spread it respiratory-wise, those large droplets won't be spread from their airway and therefore they can't become airborne. As far as somebody walking around and about outside with a mask of any kind or a cloth, that's not necessarily going to stop acquisition because we don't even know how much would disperse in the air. Remember, in an N95 mask, they're filtered in the HEPA filter, and the negative pressure room has to take that air and put it somewhere after filtering it. They put it outside. So all these things are sort of unknown, and therefore all the controversy on should the CDC have recommended masks? Well, of course. For any respiratory disease, we use either droplet-type masks, what we call surgical, or N95, what we call airborne. But as far as the general public, yes, you potentially can cut down the spread if everybody covers their face with a cloth, because if they're asymptomatic, they won't drop the droplets and potentially aerosolize them as they move along. You know, how much does the virus live on surfaces? Well, these are experimental studies. Does it really matter? The bottom line is, who knows? You can see these experimental studies that were published in the Journal of Hospital Infection. And, and, and what do those hours really mean? What it really means is wash your hands and wash the, and dis disinfect the surfaces because that's such common sense and how can you overdo it? Let's get to the last thing, social distancing, the science of social distancing. And this was a National Health Center or Academy of National Sciences presentation by Dr. Messonier, who's a director there, and these are from the CDC. If you look at the linkage to the wholesale market in China and how that dissipated and this became transmission locally, it's obviously respiratory and fomites. If you look at the World Health Organization phases and the CDC intervals, top and bottom there, you have three basic mechanisms here. Containment, intensified finding, contact tracing, isolate and quarantine, characterize illness, and non-pharmaceutical interventions which brings us to transmission out, outpaces containment efforts. Yes, if you don't do containment efforts, which brings us to mitigation, which is what we have to do to get this under control. Well, since we don't have the antivirals and vaccines that we know of that are effective right now, we have to go to non-pharmaceutical interventions. And if you do that, you can see with or without these protective measures, the curve drastically changes and our healthcare system capacity can be kept under control or the, or the need for that can be kept under control. So non-pharmaceutical non interventions or MPIs or social distancing is what's recommended. And there's a lot of controversy about that. In fact, if you look at the CDC publication recently, the worldwide sentiment that travel restrictions and self-isolation may not stop COVID-19, these are the, these are the uh, consensus from different countries. And the US is right there in the middle. Some of them think this is not useful, and others, such as Japan, think it's very useful, or India think it's very useful, and Australia think it's very useful. And what's interesting is if you look at the mortality rate in some of the countries that are shifted to the right there and think it's useful, particularly Australia, they have a much lower mortality rate. So then social distancing. These are models of uninfected persons, infected persons, persons who recovered from infection, on the bottom, you can see if there's no strategy, forced quarantine, modest social distancing, or significant social distancing. And look at the infected persons. Just look at the green mountain, excuse me, the red mountain. Obviously, if there's significant social distancing far on the right there, it works. So if we follow those things that have those dark dots on them on the, on the left, it's, it's just intuitive that this makes sense and should work. Now, how much you mandate that, that's a whole different political discussion. There are epidemiologic models of studies supporting social distancing in workplaces when we look at the influenza models. This is CDC data that's published in the British Medical Journal. And if you look at social distancing here and the implementation on mitigation for coronavirus compared to influenza virus and other pandemics, that is what always has worked. Because remember, the pre, the pre you know, World War II experiment is you didn't have very many vaccines or antivirals that were very effective. Now, is the public doing this? Well, the left-hand graph is bars, the right-hand graph is airports, the yellow is 19, uh, 2019 data, the uh, blue is 2020 data, and obviously, as time goes on, yes, they're doing it. 
people are doing it. Bars, you can see the, the blue line dropping. Airports, the blue line is dropping. Which brings us to the final minute here, treatment. Well, what we know is that we don't know. What we know is that antiviral medications are gonna be helpful, vaccines are gonna be preventable, anti-inflammatories are just not known at this case. You know, I'm sure the people who originally had the patent on hydroxychloroquine wish they had it now, because as everybody says, the studies are gonna be hard to do because most people are not enrolling in randomized controlled trial studies for obvious reasons, and the drugs being prescribed for anybody who's diagnosed positive, or at least who's waiting for a test to see if they're positive, you know, as far as prophylaxis, that's a whole different can of worms. Remdesivir, which has antiviral effect, it's an RNA polymerase inhibitor. You know, I, you know what they say, follow the money if you want to know the truth. And if you look at Wall Street, the company who makes remdesivir in the face of the stock market falling, they're, they're drastically rising. So somebody on Wall Street thinks that drug's going to prove effective. We're going to hear about IVIG or pooled gamma globulin. Well, we've done that for years for hepatitis A. That's a model that's worked. What would it work for this? We've done it for newborns with hepatitis B. That works. Interleukin-2 inhibitors. There's a group of monoclonal antibodies trials going on. JAK-2 inhibitors. There's a trial going on for that. Uh, corticosteroids are recommended against unless you're in the late stage of ARDS. You know, the information on angiotensin converting enzymes and inhibitors and receptors is plus or minus, and the controversy about non-steroidals is ongoing. So I know Dr. Rivkes is not on here, but I'm going to close with this comment, which is a personal aside. You know, when, when things go bad, people at the top always either get praised or criticized. Most often they get criticized because nobody tells you how good you're doing. People like to tell you how badly you did. You know, as fate would have it, it's interesting. When you, when you look at certain epidemiologic events, I don't know how, but somehow I, I've been involved. If you look at surgeon generals and local healthcare officials, it, you know, somehow fate would have it for me that I've been involved with a lot of them. In 1982, I, I was a resident in the ICU at Penn, at Pennsylvania Hospital, and Luther Turry, I don't know if you remember him, he was the Surgeon General of the United States who in 1968 spent years trying to get the packet uh, warning on cigarettes, saying that cigarette smoking can cause cancer. And, and that information was known for a long time, but he could not get that on the pack. I met him. I was his resident in the ICU when he was admitted for a pulmonary disease secondary to his prior cigarette smoking, which is very interesting. C. Everett Koop, who's also a Surgeon General who I heavily respected. And remember, you only remember the names of the people who were involved either because they did something great or because people want to criticize them. C. Everett Koop was the Surgeon General who really was outspoken about pediatric testing for HIV disease and what we're going to do about it in testing pregnant women. He was trained as a pediatrician, just as our Surgeon General in the state of Florida, uh, Dr. Rivkis is. C. Everett Koop, the Surgeon General of the United States at that time, early in the HIV or AIDS epidemic, trained the Pennsylvania Hospital where I did, but I, I, he's not my contemporary. He's older than I am. How about, how about other ones? Well, uh, Gene Malecki and now Alina Alonzo. Gene Malecki was heavily involved in the anthrax in 2001 when she had the bold move to close the AMI building when the CDC did not want to do that, but she got support of the state surgeon general right here in Florida. And I believe that Dr. Ripkees, who's also an academic trained pediatrician, along with the governor and, and the state who are coming out with their guidelines, what we all get, are doing a great job here. And I would follow them. So remember, reporting of post positive and negative cases are told by the health department. Return to work criteria has also re recently been put out by the health department of the of the state and local, and additional requirements for healthcare workers, EMTs, and paramedics of what they also need when they can go back to work. And of course, as we know that what changed the world is sanitation and immunization, and that's what's going to change the world here with COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Uh, I'll, take a, I'll take questions if anybody wants to ask them. I know I went over time, but then I have to excuse myself because I got to go around at the hospital right now. I'm a little bit late, but thank you. Are, are there any questions then for Dr. Bush before he leaves? Otherwise, uh, we will move on in our program. Yes, sir. Dr. Daubertine had one question. I'll unmute Dr. Daubertine. Give me one moment. Hey, hey Larry. Uh, Mark Daubertine Hi. here. You know, they, they're talking about uh, this uh, PCR test having about a third false negatives. 
Um, I just was wondering, is there any thoughts on uh, what the outcomes are on people that subsequently test positive? Are their outcomes worse? And what about transmissibility? Sometimes there's a false sense of security. And um, I just was wondering what your thoughts are with regard to that at home or at work or things like that. that well, that, that's a great, uh, that's a great uh, question because, you know, people, I, I've always wondered when somebody tests negative, that's like the biopsy negative cancer that should have cancer or the Lyme disease patient I have who has negative serologies and they tell me, I don't know about negative serology Lyme disease. And I asked them, well, how did you actually define the disease? So in the PCR positive uh, negative people who they say tested negative, I think what they're referring to is that later on they become symptomatic or a subsequent test becomes positive. And to me, that speaks to the point that the PCR may not always be detectable and depending on how many tests you do and when it turns positive. But having said that, I think there's a sampling error, like there is with anything. It's like what, you know, Dr. Uh, Giffler can speak to this. When, I, when an orthopedic surgeon gives you a 0.2 millimeter sample of osteomyelitis in a tibia, and you say there's no obvious acute osteomyelitis in the 0.2 millimeters they provided you. Let me give you one example. We have a woman in the hospital right now who's been on a ventilator for 10 days her lab core PCR test on admission came back positive. Now it took us nine days to get it back. At the same time, the hospital was trying to now send us labs to the test, PCR tests to the state, because our turnaround time from lab core was slow and we were trying to move people or for logistics of the hospital. Well, that test came back two days, and that's just yesterday, two days after we sent it, and we sent it on Thursday, and the state reported it as negative. That would either imply that the lab core test was a false positive or the state's test is a false negative or that she cleared the virus while she still has significant infiltrates on the ventilator and is doing poorly or that the test collection from the admission sample which was done in an emergency room done by the emergency room physician compared to the sample obtained by the nurse in the ICU was not as good a sample when obtained in the ICU. I think it's that it's a false negative from the state because the sample wasn't adequate. So having said that, I don't know how to take that false positive. I wouldn't call any positive a false, po excuse me, take that false negative. I wouldn't refer to any false positive. What will be interesting to see is how the serologic test correlates. I hope that answers it in a long way. Thank you, Dr. Bush. I know you have to leave a quick question. Uh, do you have a good estimate? Uh, we've heard some people give estimates in approximately one month. When do you think the peak will be here and start to uh, uh, level off and uh, decline? I agree what you're hearing from the CDC folks on the on you know the updates we're getting every day is I think the peak's going to happen in the next two to three weeks and then it's going to decline. But I think we control the peak. It's in our hand. If we really if we really isolate, contain, and then mitigate. I think the peak will be uh, faster and it will be slower. And I think the estimates of how many ICU beds and how many ventilators we need hopefully are going to be overestimated. When I look at that curve and the, uh, the rate of new cases and the rate of new uh, mortality rates, uh, I find it hard to believe we're going to get to 100,000 or 200,000 people who die from this. But, you know, that's, uh, maybe that's more my optimism than it is uh, reality. But thank you. Our uh, last question, uh, quick question from Dr. Petit. Yes. Okay, let me get him off here. Okay, Dr. Petit, we have you unmuted. Be able to unmute yourself. I did. Okay, there we go. There, there was a report this morning about ivermectin uh, active against, uh, you know, stopping the virus. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, th there are some other parasitic medications. You know, ivermectin is used for things like strongyloidiasis, uh, neurocystosarcosis. So I think that those drugs are interesting. They have some in vitro activity. Uh, we've uh, known that for a lot of these medications, but what it really turns out to clinically, I don't know. I think right now hydroxychloroquine is the one I would be most using, and you know, as we hear all the time, it's a doctor-patient decision. Uh, obviously, we'd like to have clinical trials, 
I don't think you're going to see a lot of robust clinical trials of ivermectin because I think the the companies who are going to invest in clinical trials and the entities who are going to spend their resources doing them and the patients are going to go for what looks best. I think that's going to be things like IVIG, which we're going to hear about, remdesivir, some of the monoclonal antibodies that are anti-inflammatory, uh, and um, hydroxychloroquine. Thank you very much again, Dr. Bush. You're very um, welcome. Thank you. Before we go to our next scientific uh, presentation, is um, Mr. Santorio on, on the call uh, to uh, tell us what he knows about the field hospital? Yes, can you hear me? Now? Go ahead. Okay, sorry about the technical difficulties all earlier. Um, so we have been working with the Department of Emergency Management for the state, as well as DOH, to try and plan for accommodating a mobile field hospital. There is one structurally erected right now uh, near the Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. Uh, it has the capacity to go up to about 250 beds. The majority of those beds are uh, being planned to accommodate COVID positive, right? So it's, it, the, the, the hospital is going to be COVID positive. The plan is to accommodate lower acuity med surge type, potentially tele patients. I believe there was also a plan in the works to do a 12 bed ICU. Um, but in, after we got involved and started talking to DEM, uh, it was our recommendation as the uh, health system that was tapped on the shoulder to partner with them not to do that specifically because the capacity that we have and, and we're on actually a, a three county call daily now for surge planning with all the hospital ceos what we identified is that the number of beds that we have in our systems that are available but not staffed are pretty um pretty significant so for example at broward health I uh, can use us for an example. We can staff up to about an additional 102 beds uh, right now. But if we had additional staff, we could probably get another 400 out of that. Similar with Jackson, Memorial has even more than that. Um, so our recommendation was we have some pretty consistent models going on right now, algorithms based on epidemiological studies that include some of the um, factors such as social distancing, travel bans, school closures, et cetera, some of that looped in. In the early stages of this, the algorithms were a little bit all over the map and the confidence levels were relatively low because there were small numbers. Where we're at now in terms of the numbers, we're able to, some of these algorithms are, are honing in on, on more central numbers so they all agree with each other. There is a 90% confidence level. So for example, in Broward County, we know that with a 90% confidence level, we can expect the surge to bring a census of an additional um, 300 or so ICU patients. Um, the, the reason we're still going forward with the mobile hospitals, however, is that 10% variable, if that delta is a huge differentiator. So it goes from a 300 to over a thousand. So what we're planning on doing is setting up the mobile hospital so that it can be operationalized, offload, acute care, COVID positive, but not ICU needing um, patients. They can accommodate right now, the plan is up to 250. Um, we'll be working with the vendors to, to probably build that. We're gonna assemble a team probably in the next 48 hours to, to come in and help to operationalize it. They're also putting a few up in Miami as well. Um, I think the intent is, is that these will be structurally built with the intent of not using them. And I don't know that they will have, um, you know, the staff from an efficiency model, it would be more efficient to take the staff they've been able to get for that. So for example, we have about a hundred um, for that site and allocate those to the existing hospitals. And if we get to a point past that 90% confidence level where we're in the risk factor of us surging more than what we think we're going to get. By that point in time, we hopefully will be able to staff some of these additional centers that are already set up with people from, from different states, which is what you're seeing a little bit now of in, uh, in New York. So we're already in talks with some of our safety net partners in Texas, um, Texas particularly because their surge is, is slated to be out past ours by a couple of weeks. 
So we would be able to borrow a surge of nurses and physicians, for example, for a 14 day period to help fill these mobile hospitals and then send them back out to Texas and may, maybe even be able to send some of our own. So that's, that's the plan um, as it stands today throughout the state. South Florida, as you know, the three counties they're focused on are Palm Beach, Miami-Dade, and Broward, significantly because that's where the majority of our patients are. Um, the deaths in Broward County and um, Palm Beach are increasing um, compared to the number in Miami-Dade, but a lot of that you know, has to do with how many patients are we testing, how fast are the results coming back. So I think there's a little bit of variable in there as well. Thank you very much. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I find the mobile hospital concept uh, uh, very, very important and hopefully, hopefully we won't need it, but it's good to know it'll be there. Uh, I'd like to now uh, begin a very interesting uh, presentation from uh, One Blood. As you all know, One Blood is our blood center for the entire state as well as several other states. And we have three distinguished uh, people going to uh, discuss the subject of convalescent uh, plasma. Uh, first is Dr. Richard Gammon. He is uh, their medical uh, uh, Medical director. He's board certified in clinical pathology as well as blood banking and transfusion medicine, is in, and is on the faculty of several of our uh, medical universities, including University of Central Florida, University of South Florida, and Nova. Dr. Rita Wright is their chief medical officer and is also certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, blood banking, and transfusion medicine, and is uh, a uh, graduate of University of uh, Miami and is uh, a, a national uh, authority on blood banking and transfusion medicine and multiple uh, transfusion medicine organizations. Uh, Martin Grable is their executive vice president for corporate development and would be a key person in unfolding a new program uh, such as this. He's been on the board of directors of America's Blood Center for 11 years. This is the organization that uh, uh, gathers up all the various blood centers for uh, coordination and national policy. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, One Blood. And thank you for, uh, for coming and uh, bringing us uh, this new information. Dr. Reich will start with a few words and then uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Gammon is going to give us a slide presentation. Hello, this is Dr. Wright. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I, I think you hear a little feedback, so hopefully that, that'll clear up as I go along. Yeah, that sounds better. All right, thank you so much for inviting us to talk with you. This is an extremely important meeting to us because uh, you represent the physicians of the state of Florida. Um, and of course, it's no secret we're heading into a, a pretty significant crisis. And uh, as you all are well aware, um, last week, uh, FDA approved the use of convalescent uh, plasma from COVID-19 recovered persons for treatment of disease. Uh, it has shown some very promising results actually in the studies out of China, some of which are not yet published. Uh, we do have a consultant working with us who is one of the authors on the Chinese studies. Uh, and she has um, sort of insider information. So the, uh, and there have been good anecdotes information in the United States on the few units that have been transfused uh, to patients. Um, you may have uh, become aware that the mayor of Miami, Francis Suarez, uh, was the first uh, convalescent COVID person to donate plasma uh, for a, um, a, a person he did not know whose family pleaded uh, for a donor and he became aware of it and he knew that uh, he was eligible so he donated. And um, this is anecdotal, of course, but uh, much to our very pleasant surprise, the donor had a steady downhill course on the ventilator at age 71 uh, in the hospital, uh, showed significant improvement uh, within 24 hours of receiving that product, and they were able to lower the ventilator setting. So this was very consistent with what our consultant from China said they had seen uh, in their study of 100 of these types of patients. So we think we have something here that can help turn the tide or flatten the curve or whatever it's gonna to take to get ahead of this. 
our problem, and this is what I'd like to focus my introductory remarks on, is that we have no inventory of this product. It, it's manufactured one by one uh, from donors. And so uh, we have a very um, somewhat burdensome uh, front end to getting the donors through the door because the FDA has put some guard bands around the screening requirements for these donors. So they have to be uh, eligible as blood donors, and that's simple. We do eligible blood donors and collect plasma on them all the time. So that part of the process is a piece of cake for us. Uh, the problem is that the donors have to meet certain criteria based on how far out they are from their uh, last symptom. They have to have a series of tests based on where they are um, out from their last symptom. Their you know, considerations about female donors who've ever been pregnant in HLA. Uh, so there's a series of um, tests that have to be taken care of. And this is where we turn to our physician partners in the hospitals in our community to help us because we have no database of COVID positive people, uh, but many of you do know who they are uh, and can reach out to them or family members uh, that have survived COVID and now have a family member in the hospital, et cetera to see if they might be interested in donating. It's a new process, it's been manual so far. We This weekend we brought up an automated front end uh, for the actual donor that's interested in uh, getting into the system. We hope to have uh, the front end for the physicians who have uh, perhaps a patient that they would like to treat and also a donor uh, for that patient or another patient that they would like to put in the system. So. We're in a transition period, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time for that because, as you can imagine, uh, it's been a very crazy week. We have a lot of uh, pent-up demand for this product, a lot of very uh, emotionally um, engaged people that are trying to get it to their uh, critically loved one or friend as quickly as possible, and we don't have anything on the shelf that we can hand off to them. So it's, it's uh, very challenging. Uh, it will smooth out, hopefully, unless, of course, we get, you know, the system gets incredibly overwhelmed. And um, as Dr. Bush pointed out, we have some pretty grim predictions of numbers of cases coming at us in the next two weeks, which hopefully uh, will not pan out. But if it does, it may not really smooth out too much. Um, so I just wanted to reach out to you um, to gain your understanding uh, and support as we move through this and to really make it clear that you know, it isn't something we have control over, that that the front end of it, the, the identification of the donor and the qualification of the donor uh, has to meet FDA regulations for this experimental product. And we in, entirely are relying on the clinicians uh, to do those tests and, and uh, use, you know, FDA approved <coughs> testing and do them within the ty proper time frames for us to qualify that donor. Uh, so having said that, um, you know, again, I want to thank you. Uh, this is a very uh, historic moment, I think, for all of us. Uh, we're going to learn a lot. Um, and I'd like to turn it over now to um, Dr. Gammon, who has the scientific piece of this to present. Thank you, Dr. Reich. So uh, we're going to break this uh, into three parts. We're going to talk a little bit about the um, uh, results of a study that was published in JAMA last week. Um, and Dr. Reich is correct. There's there were a few other papers out there that weren't peer reviewed and I didn't feel comfortable sharing with the group. Uh, hopefully there'll be more uh, out there. Then we'll talk about the one blood process uh, and then I've got uh, kind of a frequently asked questions section uh, and then we'll wrap it up and uh, open it to the discussions. Uh, and we've got Martin Grable here from our administrative end that'll be available uh, to answer questions as well. So the paper out of JAMA, I've summarized it here in the next few, in the next several slides. Uh, this was a, done at Senjin Hospital in China. Uh, the patients had to be diagnosed uh, with uh, quantitative reverse transcriptase uh, PCR to be eligible to receive, uh, and the CCP is the COVID-19 convalescent plasma, if they met the following criteria that you see on the screen. Uh, the patients uh, had neutralizing antibody titers that were tested one day before receiving the convalescent plasma. The ABO blood types of the patients were identified to ensure compatibility. And these patients received antiviral agents until the COVID-19 viral loads became negative. And they, that means they received it during their entire course of hospital stay. Those that received the plasma 
and those that didn't. And that's one, we'll talk about the limitations uh, in a moment of this study. The donors were ages five, or five donors, ages 18 to 60, and you can see um, the, the characteristics of the donors uh, on the slide here, I'm gonna turn on the laser pointer. Uh, over here, the plasma was collected by apheresis. Um, these individuals had been recovered uh, from COVID-19 infection and tested negative. They were asymptomatic for 10 days. It's a little different than the criteria we're gonna talk about uh, in a moment uh, for the US. The serum COVID-19 ELISA antibody titer had to be higher than one in 1,000. And if you look over here on the screen, uh, you can see that the antibody titers were definitely higher than that and the neutralizing antibody titer greater than 40. And again, all the patient, all the donors had titers uh, at least at double that. Other patients, five patients, uh, you can see the age ranges over here and they're shown on this uh, table from the JAMA article. They're all treated uh, between 10 and 22 days after admission. Uh, one of the things I wanted to, to just kind of show you, because there's a lot on this screen here, but you know the complications, most of them, uh, I guess all of them had uh, ARDS, and all of them uh, were classified as critical for disease classification. So this was, again, used selectively, at least in these patients, for those that were the most sickest. These patients received two treatments of 200 milliliters of plasma, and the unit was transfused the same day as the donation. And again, there'll be some differences between what we can do in the US and what was done in China, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The results, so for the five patients, the body temperature is normalized within three days. You can see that uh, very nicely on this graph here. One of them um, did not. Uh, a sequential organ failure assessment uh, that they were using uh, decreased in the patients. Uh, the data is not shown on the screen. Uh, you can see the PAO2 and the FIO2 increased within 12 days, and the viral load decreased and became negative uh, within 12 days uh, in, uh, in several of the patients. And when they consider the normal range zero to seven, uh, you can see uh, patient one and uh, patient four uh, met that criteria. The uh, Talking about uh, their antibody titers here, uh, the specific uh, ELISA and neutralizing antibody titers uh, increased after the transfusion of the plasma. You can see it on these three charts. Uh, ARDS resolved in four patients after 12 days. Three patients were weaned from mechanical ventilation within two weeks. Three were discharged within two months. And two were in stable condition at the end of the study period. So there are some significant limitations to this study. Is uh, you no doubt, doubt no, small numbers, five is not necessarily a large amount, and there were no controls. It's unclear if the patients would have improved with or without uh, the convalescent plasma. All patients uh, were treated with multiple other agents during their entire course of stay until the viral load became negative. That includes antivirals and steroids. Also, I mentioned that the product, the convalescent plasma was given between 10 and 22 days after admission. So the authors raised the question, what if we gave this at a different time? Would that have had different outcomes on the patient? And also whether this approach reduced case fatality rates uh, is also unknown. So the authors, the authors concluded that the study highlighted the possibility that antibodies from convalescent plasma may have contributed to clearance of the virus and improvement of symptoms. All right. So let's change gears and talk a little bit about what's going on right now in the U.S. and more specifically with one blood. So as far as patients go, the FDA does approve use of the infusion of a COVID-19 convalescent plasma on an individual patient basis with an emergency IND. And I'll show you, uh, we have some links available to that. That can be done um, either through um, a written request that can be approved in a few hours or um, an emergency phone call if the patient is very sick, uh, and that can be done. Uh, verbal can be given over the phone, followed by uh, written uh, approval. You know, it's really up to the hospitals and physicians to define the patients to treat. I showed you some criteria in that study, but that's by no means uh, standardized. And the dosage isn't standardized. You know, uh, in a non-peer review journal I looked at, 
just gave uh, one dose of plasma. So we don't know at this point if one, two, or you know, even more uh, would be an appropriate dosage. While the, the literature shows the transfusion happened on the day of collection, um, the FDA has gave us uh, clear guidelines. Uh, Dr. Reich has been in, good, in communication with uh, Dr. Peter Marks, who, who's the, the head of uh, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, or CBER, that oversees the blood banks in the U.S. And he was clear that he wants the uh, infectious disease testing done on these units before they go out to the individual patients. So even though we work at, we're working closely with our, our testing facility, Creative Testing Solutions, to get this turned around pretty quickly, it may not be the same day that we sent out the plasma product. This is just pathways to treat patients. You know, the clinical trials and the expanded access are there for individuals that are doing research. For this group, most likely you're going to be using uh, single patient emergency IND that we just talked about on the last slide. This is a physician letter, and uh, this material was, uh, you should have a copy of this uh, right out to the group. Uh, and there is a link uh, on the PDF file uh, to view the FDA guidance. And there, are, there is some information uh, for you to call. Uh, it's it's a, basically a COVID hotline if you've got a patient that meets your needs. And as Dr. Reich mentioned, we are up, you know, this is a, a work in progress. We hope to have a site up for the physicians sometime this week. Um, what do we need from the physicians? We need documentation of SARS-CoV infection and diagnose, I'm sorry, of the donors that we're bringing in. We need documentation that these individuals actually have had a laboratory test with a diagnosis. So if a doctor tells them, look, those symptoms, you know, may be consistent with COVID, self-quarantine for 14 days. If they don't have a test, they're not going to be able to qualify uh, as a donor. Also, uh, if they present 14 to 27 days after becoming symptom-free, then uh, one blood's going to need negative results uh, for COVID-19, either from one or more nasopharyngeal swab specimens or by a molecular diagnostic test uh, from blood. If the donors present symptom-free 28 days or longer, then they're eligible, and per the FDA, we do not need additional documentation uh, of a prior uh, I mean, we require diagnosis of the initial COVID test, but we do not need a confirmatory negative test to confirm recovery. So just to kind of uh, walk through that uh, uh, briefly again, we're generally not going to accept individuals that uh, are less than 14 days out. 14 to 27 days, we'll need the initial test and an additional test to show that they now are free of the COVID-19. If they come 28 days or more out after they've been symptom-free, then all we need is the initial test. No additional testing needs to be done. As far as the donors go, um, Dr. Reich alluded to this uh, in her discussion. One blood will take the lead. If it's a female who's been um, has a history of pregnancy, we will need to test for HLA antibodies because we, you know, these folks are already they're going to be receiving the units, most likely on ventilators, and we don't want to put them at risk for uh, additional transfusion-related acute lung injury that could cause their condition to deteriorate. Um, we will, the donors will need to meet all allogeneic blood donor eligibility criteria on the day of donation. Um, they, you know, the current guidelines uh, by the FDA say that the donors may donate plasma once every 28 days. Uh, the one blood medical directors can make exceptions on frequency on a case-by-case -case basis. So uh, again, that'd be something we'll be looking at uh, as we go forward, if we have issues with the donor pool, that is something that you know we could be looking at uh, if we need to get more donors in or more donations uh, available. Um, there will be a uh, pre-screening health history uh, questionnaire, uh, and this would be completed by three individuals. Uh, it'll be completed by the patients. The healthcare provider will have to put complete a section uh, that you see on the screen, and it's also been um, uh, should be available as part of the materials. Uh, for this lecture today, and then one blood uh, personnel will finish the screening of the uh, donor, and that will be signed off by a blood bank medical uh, director. And there's a paper form, and the physician needs to put an attestation uh, that's listed on the screen as well um, for the testing. Uh, the products that may be collected, if we collect it by apheresis, 
Um, we hope to get one to th up to even three units of uh, plasma that's collected. Um, and you know, just a point of clarification, because I've gotten some questions from this on docs. The emergency IND needs to be for each individual patient that's going to be receiving the product. The blood collection can be from one donor and multiple products can be collected and that can go to multiple patients. So what the FDA has told us is this is a standard blood product, just like the plasma that you would normally keep in the hospital. The difference is that this is from individuals that have recovered from COVID. Um, so from our end, if an individual, for example, uh, collects a plasma on apheresis and three components are being able to be made, then that can go to the hospital and potentially go to three different patients. Um, but each of the patients will need their own uh, uh, EIND. And if it's collected from whole blood, then it you know, will only get one unit. And as Dr. Uh, Wright alluded to, our very first Florida donor, donor was the mayor of Miami. Donor letter. So we do have a donor letter um, that's part of our toolkit. Um, and, and you know, if you have a donor, uh, that is interested, you can give them a copy of the letter, again, included with the packet. It tells them uh, where to call. Uh, one of the nice things, and we're, like I said, we're going to try to be getting it up for the physicians, uh, but we have it now for the donors, at least, online, is they can actually go right to our website. They can say they want to donate convalescent plasma, and then, you know, they, they answer a series of questions uh, here. Uh, would they, are they willing to donate? Do they want to have information sh shared? They fill out their information. Are they symptomatic? You know, uh, has it been at least 14 days? Date of the last symptom. There's a nice calendar here. And have you had the follow-up test? And, you know, then they answer this and they submit it. And the donors, if you have an individual that's interested in donating for one of your patients, they can certainly uh, talk they can certainly mention that when they're talking to our one blood personnel that they're interested in doing a directed donation uh, to someone from the um, someone at a particular hospital. So we're hoping to get, as, as Dr. Reich alluded to, we're hoping to get uh, doctors uh, from you, uh, I mean donors from your patients and also donors from the community. Go on. So last section, frequently asked questions. So what you know what is uh, CCP? Well, it provides a passive immunity uh, to antibody therapy, and there is a track record of it using it um, basically uh, back to the Spanish influenza outbreak. And you know, Dr. Bush uh, spoke uh, about this as well. You know, before we had antibiotics, uh, this was much more uh, the, these uh, plasma and the immune globulins uh, were more, much more used. Um, than uh, antivirals and antibiotics today. Uh, and it was, of course, it was used during outbreaks of uh, other uh, respiratory illness pandemics. And you can see some uh, nice pictures from the Spanish flu uh, on the right side. I've got the reference down there if anyone wants to look at further picture, old pictures. Uh, will it help the treatment of COVID patients? It appears that way. Further investigation is still necessary. And, you know, eventually we hope to be able to get uh, the pharmaceutical companies to produce an immune globulin. Uh, but that's still several months away, and you know this is a nice bridge that can be done now at this point by both one blood and other blood centers throughout the U.S. What is the antibody titer required? So you know a few comments on that. The FDA, the antibody testing is not ready to be done on these products in real time. So we're going to collect the product, we'll do the infectious disease testing, and send it off to your patients. A sample will, at this point will go to the National Institutes of Health for testing, but that will not be available until after the transfusion. Uh, we're looking at possibly setting up testing at one blood, and you can see the recommended uh, titer is what you see on the screen, uh, greater than 1 and 180, 1 to 80. And that concludes the presentation. Um, be happy to open up any questions. I think we have a question already. If I'm looking on the Dr. screen. Um, Dr. Vernon has a question. Stephen Vernon, uh, Matt, can you allow Dr. Vernon to speak? Yes, sir. Give me just one moment. Dr. Vernon, you should be able to speak. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Yes. So my question, uh, uh, Rich, is 
in order to expedite things, uh, since you know who your donor is going to be, why don't you draw the donor's infectious disease testing one day or two days before the plasma is, is collected? It's a little out of uh, uh, ordinary, but it seems like you could do that. Sure, and I'll make an attempt to answer that. And and we've got Dr. Reich here, who's basically the project lead. I mean, um, you know, it's more of a logistic issue at this point. I think as we wrap up, uh, you know, certainly that that does make sense. But we've got then the, the individual has to make two separate trips. And the way we're collecting these right now is these individuals are not going into branches. We're bringing them out to different mobiles uh, sites. Uh, we're bringing a mobile to them. Um, and then they're going to be able to be collected there. So we're trying to minimize exposure to our staff. Um, I'll stop there and turn it over to Dr. Reich and see if you want to add some additional comments. I don't want to misspeak on this. Yes, hi. Um, took me a minute to get off mute. I'm sorry. The, um, the FDA generally wants the physical exam and testing done on the day of donation. Um, not to say that... Um, you know, the medical director might be able to wiggle around that a little bit, but I think in general for the massive amount of donors we're anticipating, uh, making a blanket exception probably um, would not uh, necessarily be something that the medical director would feel comfortable doing. We would have to get FDA approval uh, to do it at any kind of volume um, that, I, that I am anticipating will have. I guess as, as long as I have the microphone, I, I, there are a couple comments I'd like to make too that um, I, I failed to in the beginning. Um, 28 days has been shown in the Chinese studies to be the day when they have the highest titer. So even though it may be tempting uh, to take somebody three months out, et cetera, uh, ideally you, um, you're really walking a very fine line there where you don't want to have them shedding virus, but you also still want a nice high antibody titer. So 28 days has really been shown in the somewhat limited uh, studies we have to be the optimum time. And the other thing I want to point out, because it came up as a, a point of confusion already, is that although we think of uh, typo as being a universal donor, uh, it is not the universal donor on the plasma side. So you can give typo to people uh, on the red cell side as a universal donor, but the universal plasma donor is actually type AB. So um, when you're looking at your donors and your patient match and you think you have a donor, just, you know, please keep that in mind that if, um, you know, you have an uh, AB patient, uh, you're going to have to get only an AB plasma, basically, to be sure that you have compatibility. Uh, Dr. Cosgrove has a question. Just one moment. Dr. Cosgrove, you're unmuted. What is the average uh, time of the first um, infusion of the plasma to most patients? Well, I can speak to our experience at one blood only, and it's an experience of one unit so far. Uh, it took us four days of a full-time team manually to get that uh, whole front end together and get it infused into the patient um, plus that included waiting for infectious disease testing. That happened to be um, a frequent blood donor, so we had a high, um, you know, expectation that they would pass their infectious disease test. But that is something to bear in mind: is that even at best, right now, it is not like a, it's not like calling for a unit of blood from the, from the blood center. We pull it off the shelf and put it in a box and send it to you. We have to round up a donor and put them through, you know, a multi-step process to qualify them before we can even collect. We do have mobile buses that we've dedicated to this, and we are willing to go just about anywhere to collect a donor. So um, once we have a donor cleared, um, the only thing that's, that stops us is the infectious disease testing. We have to draw it and then wait for it for the next day. And then, you know, we still have the hopefully remote possibility by that time that they might not pass their infectious disease test. But it oh, is not. I have a quick question. How, how do we get the word out that this program is available? Well, we can, I think we have sent to you, um, uh, the Florida Medical Association, our, what we're calling our toolkit. 
Um, and I don't know how you can distribute that widely, whether it's via email might be the best way to your membership, but you know that would probably be the best way to get the word out uh, to the community at large that um, although not widely available yet, we're certainly ramping up and uh, trying to get started. And we would love to have you know, donors that are not directed so that we could actually get a frozen inventory on the shelf to pull out you know, quickly if we needed to. Do you have a plan to market this to the directly to the public to um, get donors? No, yes, direct yes. donors? Yes. Okay. Yes, we have actually gone, you know, thanks to, um, you know, Mayor Suarez, uh, we've been on national television, uh, we've been on local television, we have it on our website, we have it on our um, social media page, we've done everything we can to uh, bang the drum to get, you know, the public interested in donating, and they can go right to our website at oneblood.org and, um, and actually log themselves in, answer all the questions, and kind of do their own pre-screen to see if they're eligible. I guess I should also mention that uh, you may have seen or heard uh, there was a press release and a press conference that touched on it. Um, the federal government has um, uh, put together a clearinghouse, um, a national clearinghouse for donors to um, and a website where they can log in anywhere in the United States uh, clear, screen themselves and put in their zip code and then the clearinghouse will then send them to the nearest blood center uh, where they are located. So we expect to get quite a few people that way once it um, becomes widely known and, and is fully running. Okay. Um, Dr. Riggs has a question. Dr. Riggs, you should be able to talk. Oh, thanks. Uh, what do we do up here in North Florida? Is Life South participating? And secondly, are the um, EIND reporting requirements to FDA and IRB uh, suspended for this, or are they still in play like for all the other EINDs? My understanding of, uh, I'll answer your um, last question first. My understanding of the EIND is that the sample we send the samples we send to NIH um, from the donors that we draw are uh, approved under a national IR, IRB for them to use for studies uh, going beyond just doing the antibody titers and, and they also can use them for a biorepository. The EIND is not under IRB, um, although at One Blood we have decided to go ahead and put the EIND portion of it under our IRBs for approval so that indeed uh, if other studies wanted to be done you know locally we could get samples and um, have a biorepository and and basically report out our findings so at this point um, Rich can probably touch on that because he's he heads up our research uh, department and um, I believe he has put the paperwork in for the IRB approval for the EIND aspect of it at one blood and then, um, and then I, it, and then there is like some national studies headed up by Johns Hopkins and others uh, that are closed, as far as I know, except to certain institutions. Um, and uh, and that's another route, you know, for doing studies. So stay tuned. Um, I think that the local blood centers will probably start uh, doing their own studies and reporting their own experiences in their communities, which would be a, a wonderful thing to see. Um, I don't know where Life South is exactly with this right now. Uh, I'm sure they're ramping up like everybody else, though. Dr. Petit has a question. There was a recently a um, report out of California about IgG being isolated against this COVID-19 uh, virus, and uh, they got this um, off to the uh, Army to replicate it. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, uh, I, as Rich mentioned, we, we talk almost daily to the head of CBER, and I can tell you that they're very excited and pushing very hard to uh, get a pharmaceutical, um, you know, concentrated IgG uh, product out to this population. Um, on the other hand, I, I must say that hearing the anecdotes, I am a little bit more of a wild card, I guess. 
I wonder if there not, might be something more than just the antibodies at play to get such um, fast results in such you know very sick patients, and maybe there's a secret sauce in there we might lose if we purify it too much. But you know we will know very soon, I think, because that antibody development is on the fast track, and we will soon see how effective it is. Dr. Vasquez. Yeah, my question is pertaining to uh, community hospitals. I work in a small community hospital, and uh, my question is pertaining whether the blood bank personnel in the community hospitals are sufficiently educated and prepared to dispense this type of product. Are there any regulatory requirements for the hospital laboratory to comply with? And if their uh, administration of the product is uh, differs in some way to what is uh, employed in routine plasma product administration. Uh, um, Rita, I, I can ahead, speak to Rich. that if you'd like. Yeah, because I've been dealing with this uh, with several of the hospitals uh, in the last week or so. So there's two ends of it uh, that need to be to come into place. Um, if you're going to have this in your hospital, there has to be a way, one, for your blood bank to receive it. So they've got to have certain codes to receive it. And your technologists, if they have questions about that, they can reach out uh, to myself uh, or we'll get you set up with the, the correct doctor in the region to handle it. Second way, the second item is your physicians need a way to order it. So if they order electronically, that'll need to be built into your IT system. If they order on paper, you'll have to have some way that the physicians can order it. But those are really the main uh, two items that come into play. Your hospital can make decisions on, you know, who gets it, dosing, uh, but that's, you know, that's all more uh, tailored to the individual hospital. You know, it, it is an investigational product, so it's really up to the individual that's ordering it, what kind of dosing they want to give. But those two logistics, blood bank uh, codes to receive it, uh, and then the codes, uh, I mean, how to order it in the hospital. Uh, if you get those together, you'll be all set. Thank you. Dr. Lynch has a question. Go ahead. Hey, Dr. Lynchus, you should be able, you're self muted right now, Dr. Lynchus. Dr. Lynchus, we have unmuted you. You'll just have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. So uh, my question was, first, thank you very much for the presentation. I, I'd love to be uh, uh, able to get the copy of the slides that, that you presented. But with respect to the fact that COVID-19 is a reportable event to the Department of Health, has there been any thought to working with the department and trying to identify those patients that have recovered uh, and then uh, go after them in a more targeted fashion? And the second part of my question was, um, is I noticed on the slide with the five patients that were treated in China, you know, the, all those five were, were given Kalitra, which we're not doing here in the States. It'd be interesting to see what the use of hydroxychloroquine and azithro is in patients that got convalescent uh, plasma. And I wonder if we have any results from the state of New York, if they're doing this yet. So I can answer the first uh, question about the Florida Department of Health. They actually were the first place we went to to try to get a donor database to see if we could identify people who were COVID positive. And, um, you know, to their credit, they actually were very sensitive about protecting uh, the patient's privacy. And so it was actually their suggestion that we work through the uh, Florida Medical Association to contact the patients and identify them. Um, and Rich, I don't know if you want to tackle the second question. I, I'm not, unfortunately, I, I'm not familiar with, um, you know, what New York State is doing at this point in time. Again, Dr. Wright mentioned we do have daily communication with the FDA um, and with the national blood organizations, but I don't have an answer for the second second part. I will say, though, about the slides uh, and the materials that we presented, we did give all those materials, I gave all those materials to the Food and Drug, I mean, the Food and Drug Administration, <laughs> too many acronyms, to the Florida Medical Associations, I would ask uh, that... Dr. Giffler, uh, Matt, and Melissa, feel free to share the PowerPoint slides and the three types of letters uh, that I emailed to you last night. We certainly want to make sure everyone has copies of those. 
And that will be available on our website. Um, we have one more question on this topic from Dr. Vernon, and then I'd like to switch to have some discussion regarding the regulatory efforts and legislative efforts uh, and to uh, affect the financial impact of this epidemic on our, our doctor's practices. So, Dr. Vernon. Thanks, Ron. Um, to Rich and Rita, I just want to let you know that uh, this subject has already been under discussion at the executive committee level of the Florida Society of Pathologists since the blood banks throughout the state are largely or almost entirely uh, directed by the pathologists. Certainly they need this information and we are going to use all the uh, material that we have available to get it out to them. But, uh, and, and my question to both of you is, you've sort of answered it, I think, but will you be cooperating with other blood centers where there might be many more convalescent patients? We, I think in Florida, there's been a lot of tests and there's a lot of positive tests, but we may not have convalescent patients coming out of the woodwork. I think there's going to be a lot more in some other geographical areas. So will you be cooperating with them Number one, to get material, treating material, and number two, uh, relative to communication and so forth. Well, I do believe that the clearinghouse is going to be the mechanism that uh, the federal government counts on to in ensure collaboration. Uh, it involves not just the independent blood centers that are part of America's blood centers, but also the American Red Cross. So you've got us all rolled up into one big a database and you have um, you know you have it organized so that it identifies donors screens donors and then sends them right back to their uh, local blood center for collection and the blood centers have always uh, had a history of collaboration in every crisis so you can count on the fact that as soon as we have inventory on the shelf and we will be sharing it with each other as needed and uh and just to add to Dr. Reich's comment, uh, these are licensed blood products, so they can be shipped across state lines. I, and yes, I mean, we, I'm actually working with a case right now where we may have a couple donors in Pennsylvania where the plasma is collected and then shipped down um, to the one blood service area. So uh, and some of it's gonna depend on the supply. We've got everyone kind of ramping up uh, their donations right now. And once we have more donations, to handle than our service area needs, then you know certainly there would be that opportunity for cooperation. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very informative, and we will all have to work hard to get to get the message out. And uh, uh, Dr. Goldman indicated via text that uh, the American College of Physicians in Florida uh, can help get this message out as well. I want to switch now to our regulatory and financial resources updates because um, of the critical negative impact this is having on so many of our uh, practices around the state. So why don't we start with uh, Jeff Scott and let us know what's new and you know, how, if any, uh, the governor's latest executive order Wednesday uh, affects any of the previous ones. Thank you, Dr. Gitzler. I want to give you a brief update on the legal and regulatory developments since last Sunday. I'm going to start with uh, the letter to Commissioner Altmaier. As uh, I informed you last week, we sent him a letter asking for some uh, actions on from the uh, Department of Insurance on telehealth. Specifically, we asked him to allow all contracted physicians with uh, to provide telehealth services to their insured patients, regardless of whether it was COVID-19 uh, related or not. We asked uh, that uh, they be able to use non-public facing remote communications uh, consistent with then existing CMS policy. And we asked to uh, ensure that the payment rates for telehealth were consistent with in-person visits, uh, as well as uh, information about how to bill for that. As of Tuesday, uh, we had not received any response from Commissioner Altmaier. Uh, despite talking to his legislative affairs director the previous week, uh, accordingly, uh, Chris Clark uh, contacted the state CEFO, Jimmy Pertonis, to enlist his help in trying to urge Commissioner Altmaier to respond uh, to our request. I think it was a good call uh, that Chris had. Uh, the CFO agreed to do so. However, uh, we have yet to still uh, receive any response from the commissioner uh, on our request. So, 
uh, given this lack of uh, non-response and based on new CMS policy, uh, specifically the uh, authorization for coverage of telemedicine through audio only means, uh, the FMA prepared and sent another letter to Commissioner Altmeyer urgently requesting him to order all health insurers uh, in the state of Florida to provide telehealth coverage for their patients uh, on a par similar to what CMS has done through the Medicare program. Uh, I know we've had a follow-up uh, on a meeting between uh, Senator Scott's office and uh, Dr. Norris and Dr. Heishi. Uh, in that conversation, uh, the Senator uh, had his staff follow up with Dr. Heishi. Uh, we've contacted our federal lobbyist, Erica Long, and asked her to follow up with Senator Scott's office to see if he would be willing uh, to talk to the CFO Patronus. They have a good relationship, uh, and the hope is that uh, that he'll be able, uh, through that uh, relationship, to move uh, the CFO and the commissioner to take some action on this. Uh, we have yet to have any resolution. We will uh, readdress this issue on Monday uh, and see if there's any additional steps that we can take. On the liability protection front, uh, we, as you know, we sent a letter to the governor asking for increased liability protections uh, due to the imposition of his executive order 20-72. Uh, we had word that the letter was well received, and we were hopeful that there was going to be something out on Friday. Uh, the word we got back from the uh, governor's office on a conversation that William Large had late Friday evening uh, was that the stay-at-home order, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the questions and the uh, implementation of that took was a little more involved than what they expected. They got a little bit backed up on uh, on their orders, and that uh, we're hopeful that there will be an order forthcoming uh, some by the by the middle of this next week. That's the hope. Uh, again, I think we're gonna if we don't hear back, we will reach out to the governor's office again on Tuesday. Uh, as I understand, now we have a phone conversation uh, set with the governor for today. Uh, I, we can bring it up there and hopefully we can uh, press uh, the point that liability protections are, are desperately needed along with some other issues. So we will uh, bring it up again today. We'll follow up and hopefully we'll see something on the liability front uh, by next week. We've also prepared a analysis of federal liability protections uh, that are provided uh, via the CARES Act, as well as the, that contained in a declaration that the HA Secretary uh, issued on March 19th. So uh, those are some additional federal protections. They're not uh, they're not particularly strong protections, uh, but they're there. They're uh, on our website. And if anybody has any questions about those, uh, contact me after this call. I'll be glad to, to fill you in. On the uh, if we're going to get something on the liability protection front from the governor, it, it looks like. Uh, that uh, we're also going to get something that we don't want on scope of practice. There's been a document that's been circulating uh, through the department that would allow AR, APRNs and PAs to practice independently uh, immediately. Uh, and that uh, is something that obviously we've uh, opposed primarily from the PA standpoint. Uh, I know Dr. Giffler had a conversation with the Surgeon General uh, expressing our reservations about uh, such a program. Uh, we provided uh, our position in an email to the department staff uh, and let them know that we didn't think that that would be appropriate. Uh, but uh, regardless, that uh, may be something that's forthcoming here uh, in the next uh, week as well. The uh, governor also issued, issued Executive Order 20-91, the Safer at Home order uh, that came out on uh, Wednesday, I believe. Uh, it mandates two specific things, that senior citizens and individuals with a significant uh, underlying medical condition are to stay home and to take all measures to limit their uh, risk of exposure to COVID-19. And second, that all persons in Florida are to limit their movements and personal interactions uh, outside of the home to only those necessary to obtain essential services uh, or essential activities. Uh, the list of essential services are numerous. There's there's probably more things on there that, than things that are prohibited. Uh, uh, and going over uh, those, it's uh, uh, it's it's clear that physician services and practices are considered essential services and thus uh, can continue to provide services to their patients as they've done before. Executive Order 20-72, the prohibition on elective surgery, however, is still effect. Uh, so if uh, you are open and you can stay open under 20-91, you still have to adhere to 20-72. And uh, that's the uh, our understanding of that. Uh, if we hear differently, 
uh, in our call today or uh, in any pronouncements forthcoming from the governors, we'll certainly let everybody know. Uh, the essential activities under 20-91 uh, encompass attending religious services, participating in recreational activities, particularly fishing, uh, taking care of pets and uh, caring for or otherwise assisting a loved one. Uh, social gathering in a public space is not an essential activity uh, and uh, is thus gatherings of uh, more than 10 people are still uh, prohibited. This order went into effect uh, on uh, 1201 Friday morning and it will main, remain in effect throughout the duration of the state of emergency. So those are the highlights that uh, have occurred since last Sunday. And, and if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, Jared, right, we have, uh, we have, uh, Question by Dr. Sion. Uh, it's um, uh, is he on the line, Sergio. Yes, one moment. Uh, Dr. Sion is not on the phone apparently. Well, it, it deals with uh, uh, the all these um, telehealth apps versus the sim simpler method of just talking on the phone, particularly for elderly patients who are not IT savvy. Um, so, uh, uh, Jared, are you gonna talk about uh, telehealth billing issues um, at yeah. all? I wasn't gonna get into that in great detail, but if the question is uh, related to the um, use of telehealth for audio only calls, is, is that uh, how I am to- I, I think that's what it boils down to, yeah. Y yes, sir. Uh, so. CMS did announce that it would pay for certain services on an audio only basis, but these are specific ENM codes that are designed for telephonic or audio only use. Um, they are 99441 through 99443. We have an article that we put out on our website explaining them. Uh, their valuation uh, varies uh, from 0.25 to 0.75 RVUs. Uh, they're worth, uh, uh, that comes out to, it's gonna depend on geography, but uh, you know, the analyses we've seen suggest uh, between 14 and $42 uh, per uh, code. Um, and uh, the again, there's uh, more information on that on our website and a link to the uh, the uh, guide on how to code for those services uh, that has been presented by the AMA. That is a you know a step by step uh, kind of thing. And um, however, other telehealth services uh, other than those uh, that have uh, you know these specific telephonic uh, codes uh, continue to require uh, two way uh, communication, audio and video. Although as uh, you're probably also aware, Skype and FaceTime are currently uh, permissible under the uh, the waiver that has been. Uh, provided or the discretion uh, that has been uh, provided under HIPAA. So, um, you know, there are some specific ENM codes, uh, telephonic ENM codes that are now uh, reimbursable on an audio only basis on uh, through Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare. And again, we have an article on that that, uh, you know, outlines those codes, outlines evaluation and res with respect to RVUs and practice expense inputs and uh, provides links to uh, coding guidance. Um, and uh, obviously it would be nice if CMS would waive uh, the uh, requirements for uh, regular ENM codes, uh, which, uh, which reimburse more, uh, you know, uh, so that uh, physicians would have wider access to telephone only telehealth services. But uh, as of this time, as of the uh, interim rule that uh, CMS most recently published, uh, they are only providing uh, payment for the specific uh, telephone uh, audio only codes. Okay. Could you go back, Jared, and then uh, go over uh, the financial resources update? I know the the uh, various uh, several loan plans, including the payroll protection plan, which is probably the largest one for doctors, rolled out late this uh, week, a few days ago. And could you could you explain uh, that and what resources are available to us? I know some of them are on our own website. Could you go into that for us? Uh, yes, sir. Um, so uh, let me uh, just uh, go ahead and start by uh, by thanking you for recognizing me and thanking the members of the board. Uh, I'll, so I'll give an overview of some of the financial programs and resources uh, related to COVID-19 that are available to physicians. Um, there are two particular uh, provisions of the CARE Act, uh, CARES Act uh, that I want to focus on, which is the $349 billion Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, that is being administered by the Small Business Administration, that is SBA, and the $100 billion health care fund that will be administered uh, by HHS. I want to uh, preface my remarks uh, by stating that the CARES Act was signed into the law just over a week ago on March 27th, uh, so uh, suffice to say this is all brand new. 
Um, as you're all aware, this was a $2.2 uh, trillion dollar financial relief package. And, um, you know, to use a term uh, that's been used a lot today, it is uh, just unprecedented in, in many different ways. Um, I say this uh, because, um, you know, uh, given the rapid pace at which this law is being implemented, the new information is literally constantly becoming available. Um, we sent out uh, information just this past Friday that many of you probably received related to the payroll protection program. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, just uh, it's important that if this is something that, uh, you know, something that you're monitoring that you regularly check for updates uh, we of course will be providing information as quickly as we get it realize that uh, you know new guidance is still going to be issued some guidance on some uh, topics related to the cares act is yet to be issued and um you know also these these programs uh, that i'm going to mention obviously there, there's more depth to them than we can cover in a uh, you know in the course of a phone call so i'm not going to attempt to give a comprehensive overview um but uh, if you go to our website we do have links to uh the the guidance from the sba and uh, from other uh entities uh, that uh, explains everything at a greater level of granularity and of course you know i can answer uh any questions that are uh, answered in the uh, the guidance that's been released thus far and uh, of course uh, certainly um you know uh if you decide to go forward with utilizing any of these programs you may want to contact uh, the sba with respect um, or uh, a SBA qualified lender, um, or of course, uh, your accountant or financial advisor, or whoever it is you rely on uh, for uh, advice or information. Again, new information and new guidance is gonna be issued, um, you know, probably very soon, uh, possibly even today, wouldn't uh, totally shock me. I wouldn't wanna have to, you know, bet my life that something won't drop, uh, you know, between now and the end of our phone call. So um, anyways, of course, feel free to contact us with uh, any questions uh, you uh, might have uh, so that we can give you uh, any, any information uh, that is uh, currently available. So let's start with the Payroll Protection Act or PPP, which uh, as of this past Friday is now accepting applications. This program authorizes up to $350 billion, excuse me, $349 billion in forgivable loans to small businesses to uh, pay their employees during uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. And uh, so most small businesses, including 501c3 not-for-profits, uh, veterans organizations, sole proprietorships, um, and physician practices, of course, hospitals, uh, self-employed individuals, and independent contractors with 500 or fewer employees can apply for this program. The amount of the loan is capped at 2.5 times monthly payroll and uh, up to $10 million, uh, and eligible uh, payroll costs are uh, capped at $100,000 on an annualized basis per employee. Uh, the amount of the loan will be uh, forgiven if uh, the loan proceeds are used to cover eligible expenses, uh, payroll costs, uh, um, and uh, certain other uh, non-payroll expenses over the course of an eight-week period. Um, and uh, employee and compensation levels are maintained uh, subject uh, to the terms provided under the Act. Um, in addition to that, um, the uh, Treasury Department has issued guidance that stipulates uh, that, uh, you know, no more than 25% of the uh, forgiven amount may be used for non-payroll uh, uh, cost. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, they expect that 75% of the amount will be used to cover payroll costs and that uh, not uh, greater than 25% will be used to cover uh, rent and uh, utilities and, and other eligible expenses. So, uh, you know, also take that into consideration when evaluating the applications and other information uh, regarding to the loans. That is in the, uh, in, in, in this information and all this other information and an even greater level of granularity, I should say, is available in an information sheet that the Treasury Department has published and which is published on the uh, Treasury Department's website, which we like link to on our website and we provide a, an overview of, of this information uh, as well as a link to the interim final rule uh, as well. Um, and so there are some there's some other terms we can get into, but uh, really uh, the the important thing to know is is this: uh, most qualifying businesses were eligible to begin applying for this as of uh, last uh, Friday, um, or you know two days ago. So you can apply directly through any uh, approved lender, um, and uh, this would include any number of large banks. And the SBA on their website has a full list of all the lender, lenders that are eligible. Um, certainly, um, you know, there, there are a couple things here that uh, I, I need to note. Uh, and first and foremost, the money under this program is limited. And I really can't emphasize that enough. If you are interested in applying for this program, you need to do uh, so soon. You need, uh, you know, $349 billion sounds like a lot of money. And in ordinary times, I think it would be considered a lot of money under just about any law that Congress might uh, enact. However, it's important to keep in mind that according to the Chamber of Commerce, uh, there are 30.2 million uh, small businesses in the U.S., including uh, around 21 million or so sole proprietorships. According to uh, Senator Rubio um, on Twitter, as of 6 p.m. on Friday, 13,700 small businesses had already applied for loans valued at more than 4.3 billion U.S. 
uh, presupposing that information is accurate. I have no reason to believe it's inaccurate. Uh, that's about $314,000 per loan on average. Now, $349 billion divided by $314,000 is a little more than $1.1 million. Businesses are about 3.64% of the total. Um, so even if we generously assume that the average value of those loans will drop in half over time as relatively smaller businesses apply later uh, to, uh, you know, uh, relatively later than larger businesses that are eligible, uh, that still would only amount uh, for enough funds for 7.28% of the estimated 32 point. Uh, 30.2 million small businesses in existence. Um, obviously, we don't know how many businesses will ultimately want to apply or what the, uh, you know, the ultimate uh, uh, average amount of those loans will be. Um, but, uh, and this is all very back of the envelope, but you get the idea that money is probably going to go pretty quick. Um, and uh, so if you're interested at all, contact your lender, visit the SBA's website, contact your financial advisor if you have one uh, or accountant if you have one and look into the details of this right away. Uh, again, an another thing, you know, so the law was enacted last Friday. The Treasury Department issued guidance this Friday. The rollout of, of this program so far has been rocky to say the least. A lot of lenders feel the guidance that the Treasury Department has issued has been unclear. That guidance that has been published may be subject to change or revision or clarification. And therefore, uh, you know, it really is important, um, you know, to note that, uh, you know, you should check uh, on the SBA's website and check with your approved lender to make sure that you're getting the most up-to-date information. Um, you know, this is, uh, again, to use the, uh, the overused term, this is unprecedented. The SBA has never had $349 billion and, and uh, you know, that they've tried to get out the door uh, now in, in just a week. Um, and, uh, you know, we can expect that this is going to be rocky. It actually shocks me the program uh, managed to roll out as quickly as it did when you think about it, uh, given that the financial uh, capital of our nation is also the epicenter for a global pandemic. Um, you know, it, it, the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of these banks are issuing these loans already is, um, you know, fairly uh, impressive when you think about it uh, on those terms. Um, so uh, the, the other thing, as well as that, uh, you know, uh, the, the law, um, you know, also provides $100 billion in uh, financial support for hospitals, physicians, and other healthcare providers to uh, cover uh, reimbursable expenses related to COVID-19. And uh, this uh, money is basically designed uh, to cover, um, you know, uh, anything that is not, uh, you know, uh, going to be paid for already or uh, by an insurance company or obligated to be paid for uh, already by uh, some other, uh, you know, entity uh, like an insurance company. In other words, this is $100 billion in funds for hospitals and physician offices and other types of providers to cover things like uh, increased staff or training, uh, personal protective equipment, and, for, and most importantly, perhaps foregone revenue from canceled procedures and, and so forth. Um, the $100 billion fund is supposed to be uh, made available as quickly as possible, and uh, there's some things in the law that help facilitate that theoretically. But um, HHS, um, you know, has been given significant flexibility to determine how this funds will be allocated. The secretary is expected to release guidance on the application process uh, shortly. Um, we're monitoring the situation very closely. $100 billion sounds like a lot of money, but uh, our healthcare system in 2018 spent about $3.65 billion or $3.65 trillion, rather, including, um, it, it, and to give you a, an under, uh, a slightly more granularity there, that uh, would include uh, somewhere in the vicinity of, of 1.2 trillion or so for hospitals and uh, you know about 750 billion for physicians uh, based again on 2018 uh, data. So I'm um, given the size of our healthcare system, $100 billion, which is a lot of money, may go uh, relatively uh, quickly. Um, anyways, uh, we've heard some rumors that are at this point are unsubstantiated that uh, unfortunately the secretary may uh, try to make this money available primarily or even exclusively for hospitals. And while uh, hospitals certainly deserve money and uh, certainly need money, uh, we also want to make sure that uh, physician practices have an opportunity to get some of that as well. So that has been a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, from the standpoint of advocacy, that's been a huge issue for us. Uh, we co-signed a letter with the AMA um, uh, this uh, past Friday to, uh, you know, to urge the secretary to make a portion of the funds available for physicians and gave him uh, some uh, information to, uh, you know, that will hopefully encourage him to do so. According to an article that was recently published in uh, Modern Healthcare, physician offices shed uh, $12,000 in March alone. And I, I don't have any doubt that that number probably estimate, estimate, uh, underestimates the true total and uh, certainly no doubt that that number has uh, grown. So again, we're uh, lobbying uh, the secretary, Secretary Azar uh, very hard to uh, set aside some of that $100 billion 
for physician practices, uh, although again, there's no official guidance available at this time, so we can't ultimately tell you how that $100 billion is going to be spent. Let, let me uh, offer my own little personal experience. Uh, I, there's the form, uh, the form to um, apply for the payroll protection plan is very simple for the practice to fill out. However, uh, before the loan can be processed, the bank, they have their forms also to submit to Small Business Administration. And that's where there's a big glitch right now because their forms are a bit more complex and they're not uh, entirely clear on how to go about completing the process from their end. Uh, so I would still uh, get get your forms filled out as soon as possible. I, I had mine submitted Friday. Friday was the day they first came out and my application was done and submitted to my bank immediately and, and they're not quite sure how to complete their end of it. Um, but um, don't waste a minute. Dr. Howard had a question about who are the approved lenders. And I want to say Jarrett referred to the website that lists the lenders, but that's not uh, necessarily a complete list. If you have a bank you work with, uh, call them up and ask them if they're an approved SBA lender. And they may not be in the list, but they may tell you yes, definitely. Um, Jared, you want to tell us, uh, or is that old news already about the uh, Medicare Advanced payment plan? Uh, yeah, I, I certainly. Let me uh, touch on that as well. So uh, Medicare has also announced uh, re with respect to Medicare Part B uh, that they will be making uh, or authorizing advance uh, payments. This was something that was authorized uh, under the CARES Act. Uh, essentially, the idea is, is that uh, Medicare will, uh, you know, get, allow you to request an amount of money up to uh, three months of uh, Medicare uh, payments. Uh, the, uh, the, the easiest way to think about this is this is essentially a uh, seven month uh, loan uh, where uh, uh, Medicare will front you up to three months uh, of Medicare payments. And uh, essentially after four months, uh, that is for 120 days, uh, you don't have to repay anything. And then uh, by the 200, by, you know, within 210 days, the money has to be repaid. And, um, you know, uh, to qualify for this, the, the qualifications are pretty straightforward. You have to have billed Medicare uh, within the past 180 days. Uh, not be in bankruptcy, uh, not be under uh, active medical review or program integrity investigation by uh, CMS, and not have any outstanding delinquent uh, Medicare overpayments. Um, the uh, amount of payment, again, is uh, you know up to three months uh, Medicare payments, um, and uh, this is uh, essentially you know uh, the, the guidance that CMS put out did not define what three months payment is. Um, I have spoken to Meridian, uh, which is one of the uh, Medicare administrative contractors, and they told me that basically the way if you just request the maximum amount uh, on the form uh, that you can get through First Coast Service Options website, that uh, they're going to use your historic data and, and take a three-month average based on some, uh, you know, uh, specific uh, months uh, in the past year. Um, but the bottom line is, is, you know, that that's basically kind of the amount that you can uh, roughly anticipate. You can enter a, uh, an amount, uh, a lesser amount as well, um, obviously. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is, is when you're applying for this, I feel the guidance is, is a little bit vague. But the good news is, is that it's pretty easy to get information. First Coast Service Options, our uh, Medicare administrative contractor, has their lines open, uh, you know, uh, five days a week. And uh, they're easy enough to get a hold of and, and answer questions as you uh, submit the form. Um, you know, this is, again, though, money, it's going to have to be paid back. Um, you know, eventually this is not a, a grant. Um, there's no indication that this money is going to be uh, forgiven. And uh, after the first 120 days uh, through, uh, you know, the uh, repayment period, CMS is going to automatically uh, start um, the recruitment process by uh, offsetting uh, the payment that you receive on any new claims to pay the advance loan. So instead of receiving a payment for newly submitted claims after 120 days, the physician's outstanding uh, balance would be reduced by uh, the claim payment amount uh, owed to them. And this process is automatic. And again, uh, the amount is to be repaid in full with uh, 210 uh, days. Um, so, uh, you know, but the bottom line is, is it, it, it's, you know, it, it could shore up cash flows. It's definitely positive. Um, you know, it, it, there's nothing bad about the legislation just keep in mind or, or about the program rather just keep in mind that uh you know this is not uh you know forgivable money or cms has provided no indication of that um 
And uh, just, just uh, you know, be aware if you look into it again, contact First Coast Service Options or visit their website for more information. We also have links and an explainer on our page um, and links to the uh, Medicare, uh, you know, or rather CMS FAQ guide uh, that was released along with the program that goes into uh, all the details. Um, one other thing I'll mention too is that uh, for MIPS for 2019, there is some uh, reporting relief. Um, essentially, um, if you don't want to report data, to uh, CMS for the 2019 uh, MIPS program year, you don't have to. Um, and uh, you can uh, apply for an extreme and uncontrollable circumstances application between now and April 30th. And uh, that basically, um, you know, if you, if you do this and you don't submit data, um, then you would get a, a neutral adjustment in 2021 based on your, again, and, and, and again, I want to emphasize this for your 2019 MIPS program year for, you know, the data that is supposed to be submitted soon under that program. And essentially, uh, so that means you, you wouldn't be penalized if you were going to be penalized uh, for uh, having a, uh, you know, a less, a score that is below the performance threshold. Um, CMS also on their website, they have a tool that you can use to see if the policy has been applied to you automatically for some people. Um, it, it will be applied automatically and otherwise you can submit an application and say in the event that you've already submitted some data, you can submit an application for the extreme and uncontrollable circumstances policy. And again, we'll have some more uh, information on that on our webpage. But uh, the bottom line is, so for, for the 2019 program year, MIPS, uh, you know, there's going to be some reporting relief, right? Um, it remains to be seen if CMS will provide a reporting relief, a reporting relief uh, for the 2020 uh, MIPS program year, which is probably, uh, you know, uh, more on your minds than the 2019 program year at this point. And CMS has said, uh, well, they haven't said anything regarding that yet, but it's up that they are evaluating their options for doing so. Uh, so uh, stay tuned, I guess. Um, I want to end uh, just with, uh, you know, a data point. Uh, according to Google, searches for the word uh, unprecedented uh, recently hit an all-time high. Searches for the word unprecedented uh, previously uh, hit their apex uh, shortly after the uh, 2016 uh, elections, and the number of searches for that word have uh, roughly doubled, uh, uh, you know, uh, during this time period relative to what they were back then. So the unprecedented uh, number of searches uh, for the word unprecedented uh, really helps just underscore how unprecedented uh, all of this is and uh, why, uh, you know, uh, it just uh, you should continue to be on the lookout for new information and, uh, you know, be aware that, that new information and, and guidance is likely going to flow in uh, daily. Um, this is all, uh, you know, a wild uh, ride. So uh, please stay tuned uh, for updates. And of course, we'll be doing uh, everything we can to post new information to our uh, website to keep uh, doctors informed and do anything that we can to help uh, financially, uh, you know, or help physicians get uh, financial relief. Uh, we understand how precarious this time is. And uh, with that, uh, I'll close. I thank you for all you do, and uh, thank you for giving me Jared, that. Jared, Dr. Murphy has a question. Yes, sir. Uh, could... Hey, Jared. Thanks yeah. for the presentation. I appreciate it. Um, uh, I'm part of a large group that you're probably aware of. Uh, we have many more than 500 employees. What, what options are out there right now for large groups greater than 500 employees? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. One of the one of the options, uh, of course, is, uh, you know, theoretically through this one hundred billion dollar fund that HHS has created, but they have not issued any guidance on that. That fund, uh, again, uh, has no uh, specific uh, limitation with respect to practice size or anything else. Um, however, um, you know, that is still something that is forthcoming. The Medicare advanced payment uh, payments that I mentioned uh, don't uh, provide any restrictions with respect to practice size either. And uh, the MIPS, uh, you know, uh, reporting relief, I, I should clarify, is also not something that is, a, you know, a function of a practice size. That a reporting relief, should your practice uh, choose to avail your uh, avail yourselves of it, is something which is, um, you know, available as well. So those are uh, three potential uh, options that, uh, that that come to mind offhand uh, that may be beneficial. Also, keep in mind that CMS has expanded the availability of uh, coverage for telehealth uh, recently, and we have uh, we can get into that uh, separately if you'd like. Um, but uh, that may um, make it a little bit easier to, to bill, um, you know, uh, with respect to evaluation and management services with, for some of your patients. Uh, another thing I didn't get to, but that I, I just want to mention is that, you know, again, you know, this $100 billion and this $350 billion for small businesses, in any event, that, that's probably inadequate, right? Um, we, we know that, um, you know, Congress is also uh, already kind of talking about a phase four package that could uh, potentially provide substantially more relief. Um, obviously, the details of that will uh, are unknown at this time because there is no phase four package yet, uh, but uh, something that we're pushing for strongly, and I know that all of organized medicine is, is for additional uh, financial relief uh, for healthcare providers uh, in that package. There may be some other options as well that, that aren't uh, coming to my mind uh, offhand, but uh, that is the, uh, that is um, what, uh, what I can, um, that is what comes to me. Well, thank you very much. I hope 
you all got something out of this and we really want to get feedback on on this i know there were some uh, questions about the time remember we had to coordinate uh, a number of different speakers and when that happens we don't have uh, a whole lot of flexibility in when we can put put this together but i will have these meetings continue as long as we have new information that we feel is worth getting out and i think i think the the cooperation and the interaction between all the virtual attendees is, as you can tell is is gradually increasing and so i think we're heading in the right direction there too so if anyone has any other comments um is tim on the line did you want to say anything Hold on one second, I'll unmute too. Okay, Tim, you can talk. And Dr. Howard has a has a has a question. Uh, Matt, what are we waiting on right now? I had to pull up Dr. Howard. Dr. Howard. Uh... Dr. Howard, you're self-muted at the moment. Oh, there we go. He's off. Oh, hey, Jared. Yes, sir. Uh, on the application form on First Coast, it says application type 855 ROIBA or 20134. Which one is the right application? Let me pull up their website. They have a dedicated website to those advanced payments, and uh, there should be a, a single Fine. dedicated form. But it just doesn't say which application type you're supposed to use. All right, so I'm looking at it now, The uh, and, and I can I can go over this with you, but uh, according, so I, are you seeing uh, the check your reason for the request box? Is, is that uh, what you're looking at under the uh, oh, there's under app application type? Yeah. The, the specific form here, and this is on, I'll send you the URL. There's one link to one form that I see, which is accelerated and advanced uh, payment form. Um, and then it just has the instructions for it, the reason that you want to apply, which would be, you know, delay and there's a one related to COVID-19 that's pretty straightforward. And then uh, I, I don't see any other forms on their website, but let me uh, send you a, uh, a link to the form that I am uh, looking at uh, now so that we can make sure we're on the same page. And if uh, we need, if for whatever reason they have any in for other, you know, if they have multiple forms or anything confusing on their page, um, I have a good rapport with First Coast. We can work that out with them and uh, in addition to you uh, in touch with, with anybody else to, to walk you through it on their end. But I, um, I will send you the page I'm looking at, which only appears to have this one form. But again, um, you know, it, they're also in a situation where I know that they've rolled this out very quickly. So if there are ambiguities with respect to how to apply on their website, we'll make sure we get that figured out for you. I'll help you with that. Okay, thanks. Well, we have two minutes left. Uh, Dr. Falcone has a question. Okay. Should be unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, yes. yes. Okay, great. Um, I was just wondering if there's anything we're doing specifically in Florida to ensure that we have enough PPE for our healthcare workers. I know there's been a lot of issues with this in New York, and as we're anticipating to see more cases, I was just wondering if we're doing anything to prepare for that. Probably our Surgeon General is, is the best one to be answering that, and uh, he couldn't make the call. Uh, does anybody else have any real uh, information there? I think uh, we have plenty now, but will we have enough? Uh, that's really uh, a Dr. Ripke's question, I think, unless anyone else on the line has some good information to answer her. Well, Dr. Giffler, we have been working with the Department of Health to uh, locate any PPE available in private practices and such. Uh, we sent out a okay. survey this last week in the FMA News and have been in uh, close contact with the Department of Health as far as anything that we can do to help. Well, it's two o'clock. I think that's quitting time. Thank you all very much to be continued, unfortunately.